Hi, everyone, and thank you for Zooming in for this special event for Curator Circle and AGO donors. My name is Julian Cox. I'm the Deputy Director and Chief Curator, and I'm speaking to you from land that is the territory of the Anishinaabe Mississauga Nation and was also the territory of the Huron-Wendat Neutral and Seneca Nations through time. Of course, for the time being, we can't congregate as we normally would do together, but we're excited to continue sharing great art experiences with you online. And we look forward to bringing you uh, more opportunities like this in the days to come. You can find information about upcoming events and programs at ago.ca. And as we adjust to this new format, please tell us what you think and what you'd like to see and hear. I'm really delighted that you could join us for this afternoon's presentation by two of my fabulous colleagues in the Department of Indigenous and Canadian Art at the AGO, Georgiana Uliaric, who is the Frederick S. Eaton Curator of Canadian Art, and Renee van der Arvid, who is our Assistant Curator of Canadian Art. And the title of their joint presentation today is Canadian Modernists, Kathleen Mum and Elizabeth Wynne Wood. Um, as you all probably know, this is truly a landmark week in the history of Canadian art because Thursday, May the 7th, just two days from now, marks the 100th anniversary of the inaugural exhibition of the Group of Seven, which was presented here at the Art Gallery of Toronto, as it was then known, of course now, the Art Gallery of Ontario. So the history and art of the Group of Seven is really foundational to the AGO. Um, but this afternoon, we're going to be looking closely at two of the Group of Seven's uh, female contemporaries, pioneers who truly opened up new frontiers for women artists in Canada during this time, and made really significant contribution to the em emergence of, of uh, modernism in this country. And they still remain little, you know, relatively little known and appreciated. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Georgiana, who will tell us about Kathleen Mum. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julian, um, and thank you for joining us. I wish we were all together, being able to drink a glass of wine together, but uh, you never know, there might be a glass of wine nearby. Uh, Renee and I are both very excited to be able to speak with you about two remarkable Canadian modernists. And I will be speaking about Kathleen Nunn. And so in order to start, I will share my screen so that you can see the images that I will be speaking to. I encountered Kathleen Munn during graduate work at York University in 1996 while studying with Professor Joy Siemens, and uh, Munn has fascinated me uh, since then. So what I'd like to do today is give you a little bit of a background on Munn, and then also share with you a truly remarkable project that we undertook last year, a very recent project in which, uh, with conservators, we were able to really discover uh, new things about Kathleen Munn's technique and her materials. Munn was born in Toronto in 1887, which was a very good year to be born if you're an artist, because Marcel Duchamp and uh, Georgia O'Keeffe were also born in 1887, so it was a lucky year to be born. Uh, Munn came from a family uh, rather well-to-do. They owned a jewelry store at Young and Bloor, and they really encouraged all of their children, both girls and boys, to really pursue their dreams uh, and supported them in that. And Munn really wanted to be an artist. I'm going to start uh, by showing you the first work. Uh, hopefully this is a work that is uh, familiar to you. Um, it is a painting that has been on view at the AGO since 2008, and it is one of the very first acquisitions that I worked on when I joined the AGO in the curatorial department. And uh, unlike most uh, Canadian artists at the time, Munn actually went and studied in New York. So this, the, the date of this painting is quite significant. I would argue that uh, 1916 is quite early. No one else was really making paintings like this in Canada at the time. Remarkable, bold use of color, uh, the way she flattens space, the way she applies um, color. It really is quite remarkable. What I also love about this painting and why I miss it quite a bit uh, is because she also, Mun that is, reveals uh, her kind of uh, very whimsical side. If you look at the painting just to the right side, you see the orange cow and you realize that Mun brings you uh, face to face, if you like, with the backside of the cow. And I think that as much as she was interested in uh, formalist issues of painting, she was also um, quite funny. 
as I mentioned, she went to New York to study at the Art Students League, and it is there that she really came into contact with um, the most advanced modern theory, as well as the most ancient art. Uh, she was able to travel um, extensively as well, but you have to imagine New York uh, in the 19-teens and early 1920s, there was no MoMA, there was no Guggenheim. It really was going to private galleries and the Met in order to be able to expose to art. So she, this is where she came across the synchromists who she studied with directly, and she continued to explore color. She exhibited every year uh, in New York, uh, sorry, in uh, Toronto. And this is what she was most recognized for, for her ability to really look at ancient and modern art and, and bring it together. Uh, as you can see, she's pushing painting right now in this new acquisition. We're very fortunate to be able to uh, bring in the collection of Bernard and Sylvia Austri, about 10 works uh, by Munn that have just recently entered the collection. And you can see that she is pushing towards abstraction, which she does actually explore around 1927, one of the very first Canadian artists to experiment with abstraction. But she was not so interested in that. In fact, she did quite a remarkable thing. Around 1930, she gives up color altogether. For someone who's been so committed to it, uh, she spends a decade drawing. And she draws basically one subject matter, and that is um, the Passion of Christ, scenes from the Passion of Christ. And she makes thousands of these drawings that culminate in 10 large final drawings. And I'm showing you this one in particular, as you can see by the credit line, it was purchased by the AGO in 1945. One of two drawings that were purchased um, by us. In fact, the only two works by Mann to enter a collection, a public collection during her lifetime. So it's quite extraordinary that these are the works that she chose to be represented by. She was quite adamant on the price and which works they were. Um, and indeed, even though uh, she continued to make these drawings until about 1940, uh, for a number of reasons, she stopped making art. So um, by 1974, when she passes away, she is actually written out of the story of Canadian art and she is uh, no longer known by anyone until quite by chance, um, although, you know, a planned, prepared kind of chance. Joy Siemens comes across her entire body of work as well as all of her archives, and she sees these notebooks. These are notebooks that she made uh, between 1914 and 1928 in New York. And Joyce realized that she was in the presence of a remarkable, extraordinary, and quite singular modernist artist. And so she began her research, and you can see uh, very much I follow in uh, Joyce's footsteps. I was very proud in 2011 to be able to give Kathleen Munn her very first solo exhibition at the Art Gallery of Ontario. And you can see how attached I am to Munn <laughs> and to that uh, photograph that was the title wall. If you come and visit me in my office, uh, you will see Munn inspiring me. So, um, I want to talk to you a little bit about this painting, again an acquisition we made in 2012 as we continue our commitment to collecting and studying and writing about Mun. We brought this painting in, as you can see, is quite uh, in rough shape. And this is how Joyce found it in the early 1980s. Key Richards, her niece, actually inherited everything and she had to store everything under beds and behind the bedposts and closets and so on. And so Joyce actually had to take it outside into the yard and take a photograph of it <laughs> in order to have better light. So we were able to bring it in um, and together with the very first uh, Kerner Conservation uh, Fellowship recipient, who was Stephanie Barnes, our conservator, we were able to begin work on this extraordinary painting. And you can see that there were quite a number of issues. One was that these soaps were coming to the surface of the paint, and so it had this kind of film. Also, there were some losses. So we began by doing some uh, reflected infrared photography, and what we were able to discover is underneath extensive uh, pencil underdrawing, which really gave us a clue into how Mun prepared and planned for her paintings. Uh, I love Mun even more because clearly she's such a planner and I love to plan. So um, 
looking in her archives, we can see, in fact, just to the extent to which she would plan her paintings. Um, these are also two new discoveries, if you like. These are two canvases that we're looking at that are unfinished. Um, this is the primer, and you can see she drew on uh, this layer of paint, and we were able to understand that this layer of paint was zinc. In fact, because uh, she writes in the <laughs> right on top of the canvas, she writes zinc, and that allowed uh, our conservator, Stephanie, to understand one of the issues, one of the problems with the paint layers, and that is her use of zinc as a primer. And so we began a year-long process of uh, discussion in terms of how far to push a painting. You can also see that it was quite dirty. Um, and really, I was quite fascinated to understand what kind of sky. And it turns out the sky was quite luminous. And I show you another detail. You can see that through the cleaning and the, and the conservation work, you can see the incredible uh, color modulation and precise line. So much detail was able to be able to be revealed. And uh, it was quite a thrill when I got the call from Stephanie to come up to conservation and see the final painting. Uh, and here it is. I know that uh, Julian and Renee are sort of sick of hearing how exuberant I am about this painting. It really was thrilling to see Mun really reveal herself uh, in an extraordinary way um, and really reminded me that uh, we have to trust her. We have to trust the artist because the work is already there. We just have to trust where they lead us. We are going to be able to share this painting with you in an upcoming exhibition that's organized by the McMichael that will feature uh, quite a number of works by Kathleen Munn, as well as Elizabeth Winwood. So I will stop sharing my screen and uh, invite Renee to take you on the journey of Elizabeth Winwood. Thank, Thank you, you so Georgiana. Much, Georgiana. And just before, Ru uh, sorry, just before you get going, Renee, I wanted to encourage everybody who's tuned in to submit uh, any comments or questions uh, using the Q&A function on your screen um, so we can feed those back to you at the end of your presentation. Thanks, Renee. Thank you, Julian. Yes, looking forward to your questions, everybody. Um, it's my pleasure today to share a few works from the AGO collection by Elizabeth Winwood. And I'm just going to share my screen so you can see my slides. There we go. Okay, so the 100th anniversary of the Group of Seven uh, is something we've been thinking about a lot in our department. And for me, what's interesting is, um, is the opportunity it gives us to think about the social context in Toronto in the 1920s, which was of course a time of great change. The, the First World War had just ended and there was a mood of optimism um, artists were looking to kind of defy academic standards and um, really push forward a new authentic art that was rooted in this place. And one of those artists um, who I'm quite fascinated with is Elizabeth Winwood. And here she is in her Adelaide Street studio, 1929. I'd like to, to talk about um, her early career in the 1920s and how she channeled the ethos of the time, um, which of course was championed by the Group of Seven, but how she really took it to new and exciting heights. In 1927, uh, she burst out onto the Toronto scene. She was only 24. She had just graduated from Ontario College of Art, now OCAD U, and she started making these really beautiful and really inventive landscape sculptures. Northern Island is radiant. It's um, deeply glowing with a gold patina, and you can see three rounded forms emerging from a black marble base, which is brilliantly reflective. We can see a single tree emerging from the island, and this is likely a jack pine. Uh, we, of course, are familiar with the jack pine as a, a symbol in Canadian art, a symbol of strength and resilience, and um, something we see often again in the paintings of the Group of Seven and Tom Thompson. But here, Wood really makes it her own by rendering it in three dimensions, and they're very highly polished dimensions, um, and it's, it is really quite unique. 
the work is not very big. It's, I would say, about the as big as my laptop, so 32, 37 centimeters wide. Um, here is a detail. You can see she's using streamlined forms that are evocative of the machine age, and she's really verging towards abstraction. Here's another view. Wood garnered attention for this work. She showed it at the National Gallery the year after it was made in 1928. And the following year, she showed it at the Art Gallery of Toronto, now the AGO. So quite the feat for an artist who was so young. Similar concerns um, are embodied in Reef and Rainbow. We have simplified design, pure natural forms, and here we have a composition that is a bit more complex. She's, um, she's rendering ephemeral elements of the landscape here. So you have clouds and a rainbow that are um, sculpted in tin, which is quite interesting. The forms are flattened and the piece is effectively a double-sided relief, whereas Northern, Northern Island was um, more of a sculpture in the round. Again, her forms are streamlined and the piece is evocative of a mechanized ver version of nature. What really elevates Wood as an artist is her experimentation with metal as a sculptural material. She's using pure tin, which she calls a noble metal because it is, it's a chemical element and it actually has its own little box in the periodic table. It has an atomic number, so it is very noble. And unlike tin alloys like pewter, pure tin keeps a mirror-like appearance after it solidifies. So you can see here in the detail, it's, it's really wonderfully reflective. Tin was also much more expensive than bronze and much more difficult to cast. So nobody was using tin at this time in Toronto. In this way, Wood sets herself apart from other sculptors. She's really asserting herself as an autonomous and risk-taking sculptor. And on a conceptual level, tin has associations with Canada's primary resource industries. Um, so for the artist, this was a way to symbolize her interest in modernity and progress and in industry. This is a work in the collection of the National Gallery of Canada, but it's interesting to look at it in kind of an evolution of her moving into flatness. So this is a, a bas relief of again, the island and the single windswept tree. Um, and I, I wanted to show this to you because it's, it exemplifies her, her deep fascination with materials and the way she lets materials really shine. So she's working with marble here that in itself is just um, very luminous and beautiful. We see her typical austere modern simplicity and uh, this work is currently on view at the National Gallery. Uh, so hopefully we can all go back and see it soon. It was purchased in 1930 and by that time, Wood was considered to be one of the most advanced and adventurous sculptors working in Canada, which is surprising if you think about how little she is celebrated really in Canadian art history. Wood's sculptures are inspired by her childhood in Orillia, Ontario. She was born there on an island in a small cabin, which her family calls the wood box. She was very comfortable out in the woods and she has an innate love, had an innate love for the region. I had the opportunity to visit her relatives in Aurelia um, to look at some of, of her archives and, and some artworks there. And um, I believe some family members are tuning in. So hello and thank you for that. It was, it was really quite the opportunity for me. Um, a lot of the works we looked at were just just amazing and, and this work in particular really charmed me. It's a drawing of an outhouse and I, I think that nothing really says outdoorsiness as much as an outhouse. So it's clear that it's clear to me that she really felt at home, you know, out on the lake. And although she lived her adult life in Toronto, she, she cherished her summers up north with her husband, a fellow sculptor. Emmanuel Hahn, and they would travel to the Pickerel River, which was at the top of Georgian Bay. Her drawings are fascinating because um, they clarify that she's thinking about land as sculptural form. Pine trees take on monumental shapes and they show her confidence in depicting organic forms with kind of broad sweeping strokes of graphite or crayon or charcoal. And there is an affinity with a group of seven, of course. 
Her formative years did coincide with the beginnings of the Group of Seven. And she shared the mindset that the landscape was a source of nourishment for the creative soul. She did differ though, because unlike the group, she championed symbols of, again, Canada's emerging industry like tin, and she celebrated new technologies through her references to the machine age. In addition to landscape, Wood was very much interested in the human figure. And I read that while she was in school, she was captivated by ancient Egypt and she visited the Rom to study their collections. And I think there is an interesting resonance here with Mun, who Georgiana mentioned was also quite interested in ancient art. And uh, I think if you look at this, this work, you can see they're working through similar ideas with the figure in the landscape. Wood actually made many, many stunning sculptures of the human form, which we can talk about another time. Uh, but for now, I'd just like to share one figurative work, which is from much later in her career. It's from 1958, but it's one that is close to home. So this is carved into the limestone facade of the former McLean Hunter publishing office, um, which is on the northeast corner of Dundas and University, and it sits above it's above the TD bank. This work is called Communications. And again, it embodies Wood's interest in modern technology. The piece is made up of two allegorical versions of the human body, here you see one, with scrolls kind of floating around them which represent newsprint, because this intersection was the heart of the publishing empire at that time. The two figures are both a sender and a receiver of information. And, and they're, they're communicating in a really beautiful and abstract way that feels strangely relevant right now as we're zooming all the time. Um, the lines have, have faded, but um, they were once highlighted in gold leaf and there was a, a real radiant brilliance that harkens back to her Northern Island sculpture. So this is just one example of her many, many public sculptures. Um, and when we go back to work, I will look forward to seeing this as I emerge from the subway at St. Patrick. And uh, I actually just learned that this building will evolve into a 55 story high rise. So <laughs> the, the corner will be even more peopled. And uh, thankfully the old publishing building will be restored and the carvings will remain intact. So we'll be able to continue to enjoy them and to think about Wood's legacy as a groundbreaking sculptor in the city. Okay, I will leave it there. Georgiana, um, maybe to just to follow up the first question for you, Renee, um, has, has uh, Wood ever had a, a one person exhibition, a sort of major solo exhibition? And if so, you know, where and when? She has not. She had a two-person show with her husband, who uh, was also a sculptor at the National Gallery, National Gallery of Canada in 1997, I believe. And she did have a show at the AGO in the 50s, but it was a two-person show with another female sculptor. So uh, no, she's not had the, the solo recognition that she deserves. Great, thank you. Um, I, I was struck as you were um, making such an interesting emphasis around um, the, you know, the nature of the machine age and industrialism, you know, whether she had any access to uh, the network of you know, fairly prominent American artists, women artists that were sort of active at that same time, people like Margaret Bork White or Elsie Driggs, you know, who took um, the industrial form and the industrial context and industrial materials as a subject for their art. Mm -hmm. She did study in New York in the mid 20s and uh, I don't know exactly what what art she was exposed to on that trip but I'm sure that she was looking at galleries and she was she was very interested in, in what other women specifically were working on so I think there's a good chance she could have been influenced by them. She was certainly looking at European artists and Georgiana's going to kill me, but I'm going to say his name. <laughs> Brancusi, I know was yeah. a big influence. Yeah. How do you say that, Georgiana? Constantin Brancusi. There. Brancusi, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, 
So over to you. Thank you, Renee. Um, Georgiana, I, I'm very interested in, you know, you, you put together the, this beautiful show, the passion, the passion of Kathleen Munn in 2011 at the AGO. Unfortunately, I never saw it myself, but I've heard, you know, great things about it. Uh, and then fast forward a few years later, we acquired the, the papers and the, the archives, which are, have been really instrumental. But how, how would you characterize the sort of um, uh, leap forward that we've, that we've made, you've made with other scholar, scholars and colleagues in our understanding of who Munn was as an artist in the last decade? Yeah, I would say that uh, it's been quite extraordinary to see that uh, many young scholars, but also established scholars are, are taking up Munn, you know? Um, there's a, there's a young scholar, for example, who is looking at Mun and the history of modern dance because there's something about movement in her work. So I love that idea. You know, I feel the way in which sort of uh, Joyce kind of uh, passed it on to me and then I get to pass it on to the next generation. But in the last decade or so, I would say that every, in, every publication that deals with uh, modernist art in Canada or with abstraction in Canada now uh, has Mun very well embedded in that story. And it's interesting as I was doing research in very early sort of 1920s and 1930s uh, writing about the group and their contemporaries, Mun and Winwood and many other women artists were very much mentioned and very much part of the the artistic community and recognized as such. And it's actually around 1967 and the seventies um, as the sort of canonical quote unquote books that are, that were being written uh, that these, uh, these artists were being kind of left out. And do we know, sorry, I might've missed this, but what do we know if anything about uh, any sort of relationships or connections between these two artists that we're talking about today? I mean, did they, know each other? To what extent did they cross paths with each other? I'm not sure if they knew each other, although I do, I do know that Mun was quite active actually at the AGO. Um, and so all of the artists, all the Toronto artists, as they came and saw exhibitions, uh, as they looked at each other's work, as they read about each other's work, um, I imagine they would have known of one another. What do yeah. you think, Renee? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, Winwood was very much focused on sculpture and was a very active member of the Ontario Sculpture Society. So I feel that her efforts might have been kind of focused in that group in advocating for sculpture as, as an art form that should be exhibited and collected and should be traveling. Um, so I know she dedicated quite a bit of time to those circles, um, as well as public art and monuments and, and sort of that direction. And I did mean to mention that Mun was invited by the Group of Seven to exhibit twice at their exhibition in 1927 and 1928. And her work was included in a very important publication in 1928, including a reproduction of her work. So um, I think that uh, as we think of our current community of contemporary artists, um, it's actually always a very varied and um, sort of multivalent, if you like, uh, artistic community. And that was the beginning of that in Toronto. Uh, artists really supported one another in their vision to create a new vision of art in the city, in a city that at that time was, was quite conservative. Yeah, very small. And I think it's interesting you, you used the term invited. She was invited. And of course, our great colleague and, and friend Sarah Milroy is putting together this important show for this for uninvited Canadian women um, artists in the modern moment. And, and I think, um, can you say a little bit about the way that um, you have both worked as, as scholars, as professionals in the field with a sort of larger network? I mean, within Canada, you have... Um, great uh, art historians and colleagues like Sarah and also uh, entities like the Art Canada Institute that are doing so much to sort of expand our understanding of, of um, the history and the, and the artists that, that have contributed. So how do you think that the, the um, sort of field may turn and, div and grow uh, based on uh, what we're going to see later on this fall? Well, I think that uh, we are going to be introduced and in some cases reintroduced 
to some fabulous, uh, remarkable painters and sculptors. Um, the Art Canada Institute, for which I actually wrote a monograph on Kathleen Munn, it was uh, the kind of the first one, uh, it, um, I think allows people all over, uh, because it's of course free on the internet in both English and French, to become acquainted with Mun's work, uh, along with all of the other artists that the Art Canada Institute um, has been celebrating. So I noticed that uh, among the community of curators and scholars and just in general people who love Canadian art, that, um, that there is a really increased appetite in finding out more about the extraordinary artists that were active in the 1920s and 1930s in Toronto. I feel like for a very long time we were kind of cheated and only knew very little and now we understand that it's actually a very wide kind of kaleidoscopic uh, view of the kinds of artists that were working in the city at that time. Yeah I think it also in a for me sort of uh, parallels in an interesting way the way that our our own indigenous and Canadian department uh, has tried to sort of change the narrative the way that we we talk about um, history and art uh, in this land in this place but being a mixture um, of both indigenous uh, influences and, and trajectories and histories and and then um, Euro Canadian or sort of settler Canadian histories and can you say a little bit about, about the work that, that you've been doing as a team, sort of leading a team along with Wanda Manabush uh, around sort of creating new narratives of, of um, Canadian and Indigenous art for our public? Yes, about uh, two years ago, um, Wanda and I sat in a park and then talked to Stefan and we were able to uh, create uh, this new department, the Indigenous and Canadian Art Department. Canadian art has been with the AGO from the very beginning. Uh, I like to think that the Grange House is the first object that entered the collection. And so it was not always permanently on view. It was around 1970 that uh, the Canadian art collection had its own permanent space, actually around 1975. So when um, Wanda and I got together and started to think about Indigenous art and Canadian art and what it means to, to showcase and celebrate artists of this place, uh, we began to think about a treaty relationship and that's how we work. We work in relation to one another. We work independently. So sometimes exclusively the focus will be on Indigenous art, sometimes on Canadian art. But in the McLean Center for Indigenous and Canadian Art, it really is a coming together of us uh, uh, bringing artists in conversation with one another, really centering artists, centering um, primarily uh, contemporary indigenous work that is in dialogue, in conversation with historical Canadian artists. And um, this has been my area of research and exhibition planning for some time, Canadian women artists. And so um, there just might be more women artists on view than men, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just add, as you walk through the McLean Center, with these, these pairings that are so surprising and so creative, um, it's wonderful the, um, the resonances that, that kind of emerge every time you walk through. Um, and I think each person will have a different reading of the work, but um, I just think it's, it's quite a feat curatorially to be able to have that element of surprise. And we're changing the works quite often in the McLean Center. So if you come back, chances are, something or other will have switched out. So it, it's a very active space. Thanks, Renee. And I think um, it's important for everybody who's tuned in to know that this fall we'll be uh, releasing a new publication called Moving the Museum that is a, a kind of a, a sharing or a presentation of the way that the Indigenous and Canadian collection has reformed itself in the last few years along the lines that both Renee and Georgiana outlined. And so I think you'll find uh, new kinds of encounters, new ways of thinking about artists across uh, different generations and cultures in a way that reflects uh, how we, we you know, intend to program and grow our collections uh, moving forward. So uh, be on the lookout for that. We'll, be, we'll certainly have some other uh, public events that will celebrate that publication when it hits the stand, so to speak, um, uh, this, this fall when we, we come out of our lockdown that we're currently in. 
Um, I think we're sort of around about at that moment where we need to um, close up shop. So I want to thank everybody mu uh, very much for joining, uh, specifically Georgiana and Renee for sharing their expertise, their passion and their knowledge in, in such a lovely way with everyone who's tuned in. And um, invite you all to please join us again this Thursday, May the 7th, which is that 100th anniversary date I mentioned, when our director and CEO, Stefan Yost, will be in discussion with Glenn Lowry, who's the director of the Museum of Modern Art in New York, of course, but used to at one time be the director here at the AGO. So uh, please join us for that. For more information, you can go to ago.ca and you can click a link to register. So thank you very much for joining and, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.